morning's Torah Parsha is called Shemini in Leviticus and it's about Nadav and Avihu and how they did something that the father did not ask them to do and in the presence of God when we add to or subtract from God's word we in essence are holding on to darkness doing things our own way and we're gonna see what happened to them and the Hof Torah is paralleled in that Nadav and Avihu did something God asked them not to do and they died and in the Hof Torah in 2nd Samuel chapter 6 we're gonna go through the chapter 6 through chapter 7 verse 17 we're gonna see that when David was bringing up the Ark of the Covenant that he had a Levite named Uzzah who did something God asked him not to do and that was don't touch the Ark see darkness cannot coexist with light and so when you see that there's a theme here in that two Levites both did something that God asked them not to do and we're going to see a history of different types of priests who have done things that God asked them not to do and we're gonna get a model of what not to do but the beauty is we're not gonna end there we're gonna look at King David and how he rectified the situation and he stepped in the gap as a type of Melchizedek priest he was already reigning as king he put on linen ritual vest like a priest and he made sacrifices and he rectified the situation that caused the death of Uzzah and in that way act as an intercessor as a high priest and as a king and this is the model that Yeshua will come and reign in as high priest and king this is the order of Melchizedek Melchizedek means king of righteousness and he reigned over Jerusalem he was a king of peace king of Salem at that time uh, Shalom which later became known as Jerusalem, city of peace and he is the original model coming down from Adam of the priesthood as high priest and king and we're going to see how this priesthood was intended to be carried out by Israel as a royal priesthood every firstborn of Israel from all the tribes were supposed to be able to be a royal priest but because of the sin of the golden calf and then bowing the knee at the golden calf only the Levites carried that on who did not until such a time that this original covenant with Israel could be renewed through Yeshua he's gonna come and reign as the high priest and he's gonna renew covenant Israel it's not a new covenant it's not something new it's something renewed it's what God already intended for us to live as a royalty in righteousness and in peace and to be an example in that way a light to the nations so we're going to first start off with Nadav and Avihu in the Torah portion and then look at the Hof Torah and then create a model of what not to do here's some bad examples that I've written on the board for us and we will look at those and then we will go into the correct model that David exemplified and that Yeshua as a son of David carries through so if you have your Bibles you can look at Leviticus 9 and just roughly I'm going to take you through a very quick uh, synopsis of the um, Torah portion and the Hof Torah so that we can get into the meat of this beautiful prophecy that God gave through the prophet Nathan to David about how God would send one of David's sons to build the temple return the exiles and to reign as high priest and king the book of Samuel is written by of course the prophet Samuel and he's another one who is officiating as a type of this Melchizedek priesthood because if you look at some of these bad examples like Korok um, he was a son of Kohat now we know only the sons of Aaron could officiate as priest right the Kohat would carry the furniture of the temple when Israel would move but they weren't to actually touch the holy things so what's interesting is Korok he died coveting Moses position had jealousy then he created slander in the camp and created a rebellion and caused the death of many others who followed him in that rebellion they all died but remember in that passage that there were certain sons who repented and they did not die certain sons of Korok and of Kohat well what's amazing and what's like Paul Harvey says the rest of the story is you don't realize because it doesn't clearly say it in the scriptures but 
the descendants of those repentant sons of Kohat is the line that Samuel came through. So he wasn't even a Kohen of the lineage of Aaron, but he was a Levite from the descendants of Kohat. And it shows the power of repentance that these men that their forefather had sinned in such a grievous way and died, their repentance could bring such a righteous one as Samuel, who at his time was just after Eli, another example of a bad priest who was full of gluttony. We know he was... Uh, he had a self-control problem with eating, <laughs> let's put it that way. And his sons uh, were not raised up righteously, and so they weren't able to continue the priesthood. So Samuel steps in the gap as a priest, even though he's not a son of Aaron, he is a Levite, and he's taught the oracles of God, and God speaks through him as a prophet. So we have prophet, priest, and then he's the last judge of Israel. So he's really ruling as a type of rulership that God originated for Israel before the people asked for a king. It wasn't God's original intent that they would have a king. God was to be their king, and he set up judges underneath himself to rule the people. And this is what Samuel was. So in all essence, he's after the order of Melchizedek as a prophet, priest, and king, which we see Yeshua exemplified. And then in the Hoth Torah, we see Uzzah. We're going to see he had a lack of faith in trusting God. When the oxen stumbled, he thought he needed to touch that ark. And... Of course, the ark didn't, wasn't going to tip over, but God had told him, the, Co the sons of Kohat are to carry the furniture after Aaron, the sons of Aaron have wrapped it sufficiently and put it on carts. So they're never to touch it. It says you can carry it on, with your oxen and by hand, but you cannot touch it. Well, Uzzah is another son of Kohat. So it makes more sense when we understand why when he touched it, this was a direct uh, commandment that he had broken. And then, of course, other priests in the future that uh, had fallen into idolatry. We have a long example of both sons of Aaron as well as sons of Kohat, Levites, that gave us a bad example and fell into sin. So Samuel is the son of Elkanah. And he's from Ephrat. This is the same place that Yeshua was prophesied to be born in. Ephrat, Bethlehem. And the Levites would stay in this area of Benjamin, which was just outside of Jerusalem. As those of you that have gone to Israel with me know, Bethlehem is not very far uh, from Jerusalem. And First Chronicles clarifies that he was a Levite, even though they lived in Ephrat. And Shemuel comes from Shema El. It means God hears because Hannah had prayed. She was a, a wife of the very wealthy man who had two wives. The other wife had lots of children. She had no children. And she went to the temple there where Eli was officiating in Shiloh. And she said, God, if you give me a son, I will dedicate him to you. And Samuel became more righteous and a better ruler than any of the previous priests. So it's beautiful. God truly hears our prayers and our repentance. The fact that the sons of Kohat had repented, their prayers were heard by God and it's confirmed in this righteous prophet, priest, and ruler, Samuel. And he's speaking roughly around the time of King David's reign. And uh, we're going to see, um, at least in 2 Samuel 6 today, that this is occurring right around 1000 BC. And, of course, all Israel is still together. They haven't been divided yet. And the Haftor is going to speak of the death of Uzzah, and it parallels the Torah portion with Nadav and Avihu's death. And so we have to kind of ask ourselves, whenever we see a correlation in Torah or in the prophets, what is it trying to tell us? What's the theme, the common denominator? And this time of year, we read this Torah portion because we're reminded that we need to be without old leaven. Old leaven is old thinking. Sometimes it's the way that we have said, oh, that doesn't matter to me today, and we erode at God's word and we subtract from it. In other ways, old leaven is adding to, building fences around, and having certain traditions of men that we add to the word of God. So whether we add to or we subtract from, we see this is represented by old leaven. And this is exactly what these priests had done. Nadav and Avihu, they had added smoke to the uh, censer, fire, and incense. When Moses had told them after seven days of purification, God is going to appear in all his glory to you. 
the censers had never been used. The temple had just been built. And the last phase of building the temple was consecrating these priests for seven days. They had to sit outside the temple and they were to be made totally holy. And it was Nadav and Avihu who took, took it upon themselves, probably due to fear that the glory of God is going to appear. Let's create smoke as a type of veil, just like God led Israel through the wilderness and he clouded himself in a column of smoke by day. And at night, of course, the darkness veiled him and it looked like a column of fire. So it was most likely out of fear that they added this fence, this talk a note, if you will, uh, causing them to add to God's word. We have to be careful of this type of leaven, adding to or subtracting, because Deuteronomy 4.2 says, you shall not add to or subtract from my word. So this is how it relates to even the time in which we're reading this. And we recognize the one without leaven, Yeshua, who is a prophet, priest, and ruler coming back to be king, and who is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, who will officiate righteously after the order of Melchizedek without any leaven, without adding to or subtracting. He's going to rightly divide the word, and in so doing, write it upon our hearts for a thousand years, so that we are prepared to be a kingdom of priests when God in the eighth day, the eighth millennial day, appears in all his glory, just like what was paralleled in the Torah portion in Leviticus 9. You noticed he says, today in verse 4, is the eighth day Adonai is going to appear to you. They've consecrated themselves for seven days, just like we are supposed to be sanctified over the last 7,000 years. And the 7,000th year will begin when Yeshua returns. And for a thousand years, that's that seventh day that ultimately sin will be done away with by having Torah written upon our hearts. So we're being made holy through the seven days. And then the eighth day, God is going to appear in all of his glory. That's when the new Jerusalem descends and, and we see a new heaven and a new earth. So there's this parallel between the eighth day and... This week's Hoff Torah mentions about how Uzzah was struck dead when he disregarded the warning of God in Numbers 4.15 and touched the Ark of the Covenant, reminiscent of Nadab and Abihu's death described in this week's Torah reading. The Holy Ark had been in storage in the house of Avinadav, a Kohite, for many years, ever since the destruction of the tabernacle in Shiloh. And recently crowned King David decided to move the Ark to the new capital, Jerusalem. And he had the ark placed on a cart, and it was transported amidst singing and dancing. But we're going to see how Moses prepared for them to be in the presence of God by making sacrifices and um, prayer that wasn't done by the priests in David's time before they came in the presence of God with the Ark of the Covenant. So this is going to be an interesting correlation also. When the procession reached Goran, Nahon, the oxen misstepped, and Uzzah, Abinadad's son, took hold of the ark to steady it, whereupon he was instantly killed. David became afraid at this point, but it was the right kind of fear. There's a mixture of, you know, the wrong kind of fear where you fear God, like Nadav and Avihu. God says, I'm going to appear in, your, in all my glory. And they said, well, we better cover that glory up with smoke. Where there's a righteous fear, a fear of the Lord that we need to have, which is to rightly observe God's commandments because we have a holy awe for him and we realize they're for our own best good. So David actually takes three months out. He parks the ark and he makes sure that he gets everything right before he continues to carry the ark uh, up from Oved Adam, the Edomite where it had remained for three months. So we're going to look at some interesting parallels here. And as I mentioned, this Torah portion took place on the eighth day, symbolizing the eighth millennial day, in which God will appear to us in all his glory. Adonai was to appear after all the sin was done away with. And this is exemplified in the Torah portion in that all the priests did every single kind of sacrifice, all six of the sacrifices, the peace offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering, the trespass offering, before Adonai was to appear. This is representative of us doing away with all sin so that God can appear and we can be recreated in His image. This was one of the things that the priest in David's day forgot to do before they carried the ark up. Because remember how the glory of the Lord was present between the cherubim on top of the ark of the covenant? So in essence, they're bringing God's glory to the city Jerusalem, and yet they're still carrying darkness. 
Then in verse 22, we see Aaron raises his hands and he pronounces a beautiful Aaronic blessing. The same Aaronic blessing that we did this morning, he placed over the people, preparing them to have God's name on them before they're in the presence of God. Then yod heh vav -Heh appears and we see Nadav and Avihu thinking in their own wisdom that it would be a good idea to create some smoke with the fire and the incense from their censer to kind of veil this glory. And God's intent is that he will not in the future have to veil his glory. He wants to have a royal righteous priesthood that he can dwell within. Building a physical tabernacle was to be temporary only because it represented our temporary bodies, the vessel, the flesh. When David says, I want to build a house made of cedar for you, God says to the prophet Nathan, I never asked him to build me a permanent dwelling. All these years I've dwelt in a temporary dwelling. And see, it's kind of like we take things upon ourselves to add to God's word, and then we miss the beautiful symbolism in that, that it's just temporary, that he's in another tabernacle he dwell he desires to dwell within our tabernacle and that was the real intent of it so Nadav and Avihu they're Levite sons of Aaron and they had this wrong kind of fear because they were still harboring darkness and apprehension of God's character perfect love cast out fear when you get a right understanding of who God is you will not fear him any longer you will have gone through a process of repentance and you'll have made yourself pure and without sin and seeing God's grace if he tells you that I'm going to appear to you you will trust him that it's for your own good he wants to dwell within you well they had the wrong kind of fear obviously they were thinking they couldn't handle the glory of God and that it needed to be veiled we need to have the right kind of fear which is holy awe for his commandments and so as an example, they died in their sins. Then in the Hoth Torah, we see a similar event with Uzzah. He's also a Levite, but instead of from Aaron, he's from Kohat. And he didn't have the right kind of fear, which is holy awe for the commandments. In Numbers 4, 15, God said to the Kohites, you are to carry the furnishings, but you're not to touch them. This is a strict commandment. Aaron and his sons can touch them as they wrap. You know when, let's say this was the altar of incense and then there would be a veil and then the Ark of the Covenant would be behind the veil in the most holy place. Aaron and his sons would take down that veil and walk backwards and place that veil, beautiful veil, on the Ark of the Covenant and they would wrap it with the, arc of the, with the veil. Then they would cover that veil with a leather from probably the roof of the tabernacle. So that way no water could permeate down through there. And it also protected because wool, when it rubs up against pure gold, it creates an immense electric charge, like static electricity. And so the wool of that veil alone would have created like this electrical field around it and that may very may, very may well have been what killed Uzzah that God was trying to prevent him from touching so that leather would have buffered that and then on top of the leather there was beautiful blue cloth representing the commandments of God that would be the final covering so the Ark of the Covenant had three coverings that the sons of Aaron would cover it with before the Kohites could even go and lift up even the pole they're not supposed to touch the actual gold they had wooden poles and this way they didn't receive that charge and then they were only to carry it and put it on a oxen cart and then the oxen carried it so this is what David is doing but in the story, which we will read here shortly, we will find that they didn't prepare themselves by offering any sacrifices. So it's in essence, they're not uh, atoning for their sins before they come in the presence of God. And there was no blessing placed over them by the priest. The priest failed to do their job. But we're gonna see that David steps in the gap and after three months of meditation on, wait a second, this is serious business, we better get this right. He comes back and he acts as a type of priest and blesses the people and offers sacrifices in a ritual linen garment. So over here, I've done some correlations with the Torah portion in the first column and the Hoth Torah in the second column. We're gonna see in verse two and three that the Ark is brought up. And this is representative of the seventh millennial day when the Ark will be returned to the temple that Yeshua builds, that Messiah builds. 
we see that Adonai desires to appear in his glory. Now Adonai's glory resides between the cherubim and the priests forget to sacrifice and to atone for all the sins before coming into the presence of the ark. And where in Nadav and Avihu's day, the people were blessed by the high priest, by Aaron. So they did sacrifices first, then they placed the Father's name upon them. The people are not blessed. And Uzzah dies for not trusting God. David then becomes afraid. And I'm sure there was a moment of the kind of fear like, I could die also because I know I'm unclean. I know my own sins. I know my own heart. So he takes three months. He parks the ark and goes, and he must have been meditating on God's word because what he does when he comes back is amazing. He corrects the oversight of the priest in the word. You're going to see he acts as a priest wearing the linen ritual garments. It's actually called an ephod, the vest. And he offers sacrifices. Now, he's not a Levite. He's from Judah. And people say that, oh, you have to be from Levi to officiate as a priest. But Melchizedek wasn't a Levite. And Abraham, when he came back from conquering the kings, paid a tithe to Melchizedek. And Levi, the scripture says, was in the loins of Abraham. Therefore, the Melchizedek priesthood is superior in that even Levi paid a tenth or a tithe to the Melchizedek priesthood. This is the order that Melchizedek's granddaughter passes down through Judah when she has twins with Judah. So Melchizedek's blood literally gets transferred through Tamar, his granddaughter, who Judah had taken for his sons, but his sons could not be with because of their wickedness and because they were actually from a Canaanite mother. And Judah ends up having children with her and carrying on this Melchizedek priesthood blood to David of the line of Judah. And through Judah, the prophesied son of David, Messiah. So this is how we're going to see how this is actually scripturally of a higher order. So, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 1. And we're going to read through chapter 7, verse 17. Again, David summoned all the picked troops of Israel, 30,000 men. Then David, taking along the entire force he had with him, set out for Baale Yehuda to bring up from there the Ark of God, which bears the name of God. The name yod heh vav heh means the Lord of Hosts, enthroned above the Kerovim. They set the Ark of God on a new cart, and they brought it out of the house of Avinadad on the hill with Uzzah and Akko, Akio, the sons of Avinadav, driving the new cart. They led it from the house of Avinadav on the hill with the Ark of God. Now, Avinadav means my father is noble. It's a very interesting name. And David and the whole house of Israel celebrated in the presence of Adonai with all kinds of musical instruments made of cypress wood, including lyres, lutes, tambourines, rattles, and cymbals. So they're praising God. They're coming up with much joy to bring the ark to Jerusalem. But they haven't looked at the original model. Where do we find the original model of how to do things? In the Torah. And the way that Moses and Aaron had prepared the people for the presence of God with sacrifice and with the blessings, this had not been done. And so when they arrived at Nahon's threshing floor, the oxen stumbled and Uzzah put out his hand and touched the ark. But this was in direct disobedience to the Torah commandment in Numbers chapter 4, verse 15. And this energy of Adonai that's surrounding the ark struck Uzzah on the spot and he died there and it upset David that Adonai had broken out of this it's kind of like the presence of Adonai had broken out from the ark you know there's this electrical charge around the ark he's interpreting it as if God had uh, killed him but I think there's a natural cause and effect when you understand what's happening behind the scenes and we have to trust God sometimes blindly not understanding why these things have happened and so God, remember David comes through this one son of Melchizedek's granddaughter. Remember she had twins, Perez and Zerah. 
The interesting thing is that Perez means breaking out, because Zero was the first one to stick his hand out, and they tied a scarlet thread around his arm. And then it was drawn back in, and Perez came and broke out first. So they called him breaking out, and that's what Perez means. Well, David actually calls this spot where this happened with Uzzah that God broke out. So he calls it Perez Uzzah. Yeah, he actually named it after Uzzah. Peretz Uzzah means the breaking out of Uzzah ever since. It's been called that. David was frightened of Adonai on that day. So once again, we correlated the wrong kind of fear with the right kind of fear. He's going to, though, rectify that fear by perfecting it in the love of God's Word. And he goes back to God's Word, and he gets a holy awe. That's the right kind of fear when the Bible talks about having a fear of the Lord. And he understands where they went wrong. But at first he's frightened, and he asks, How can the ark of Adonai come to me? So David did not bring the ark of Adonai into the city of David. Rather, David took it over to the house of Oved Edom, the Gitti. The ark of Adonai stayed there in his house for three months. And look at how God is trying to take away David's fear. He blessed the house of this Edomite. For three months, this man prospered and had tremendous blessings because the ark resided there in his house. David had the wrong kind of fear. All of a sudden, you can fear God and that, oh, God killed Uzzah. But that's an erroneous thinking. God said not to touch the ark. He was trying to protect Uzzah. He knows the natural cause and effect and, and the physics of the, the universe. And so here, imagine hot, arid, uh, arid desert, and you've got this ark slipping back and forth on this oxen cart, rubbing with this wool covering over it, and this electrical charge is building up and building up and building up, and a huge static electricity that anyone would have a heart attack if they touched it. And yet, you could look at it from an outside perspective and think, God did that. God arbitrarily killed that person. So God's showing that the ark is not something to be afraid of, and his presence is not something to be afraid of by blessing the house of Ovad Edom. And so then, the Bible doesn't tell us that David was searching the scriptures, but look at what he does. What he does is exactly what Moses and Aaron did as they were preparing the priest for the presence of Adonai. King David was told, Adonai has blessed the house of Ovad Adam and everyone who belongs to him, thanks to the Ark of God. So David went and joyously brought the Ark of God up from the house of Ovad Adam into the city of David. When those bearing the Ark of Adonai had gone only six paces, he sacrificed an ox. So now he's sacrificing, atoning for the sins of the people and a fatted sheep. Then David danced, and he spun around with abandon before Adonai. This shows a complete lack of fear in the wrong sense, that he's completely connected to Adonai, and there's no self involved. If there's self, you become self-conscious, right? And you say, well, I'll do this, but I'm not going to act foolishly. I'm not going to dance around. Remember, even Saul's daughter, Michal, later rebukes him for dancing around and looking foolish. And he's like, I'll gladly be humiliated for the Lord. So you see something changing in David where now he's sacrificing where the priest did not sacrifice, and he's wearing this ritual uh, linen vest. It says in verse 14, and he's dancing around with no thought of how he looks, totally engrossed. His whole focus, and this is a good example for us as a royal priesthood, our whole focus to be on God, devoid of self, and worried about what other people are thinking of us because we're keeping God's commandments. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of Adonai with shouting and the sound of the shofar. As the ark entered the city of David, Michal, the daughter of Shaul, watching from a window, saw King David leaping and spinning before Adonai, and she was filled with contempt for him. They brought the ark of Adonai in, and they put it in its place inside the tent that David had set up for it. Then David offered more burnt offerings and peace offerings before Adonai. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and peace offerings, what did Aaron do back in the Torah, the very Torah portion about Nadav and Avihu, after they offered sacrifices, he stepped out and he blessed the people, placing the holy name upon them. So David offers all of these sacrifices that Aaron had offered, and then he steps out and he blesses the people in the name of yod heh vav -Heh. Lord of hosts.
This is something only a high priest would do. This is the Aaronic blessing reserved for the high priest. He's now officiating by faith in the order of Melchizedek, which supersedes the order of the Levites. Then he distributed to all the people of Israel, to everyone there, both men and women, a loaf of bread and a portion of meat and a raisin cake and wine, after which all the people left for their homes. So the ultimate fulfillment of Torah, even like when we're fasting to observe the commandment of Torah, what does God say is his kind of fast? to bless the poor, the widows and the orphans, to do good. So David's even, he's obviously been studying Torah because he does the sacrifices, he, he's wearing the linen vest, he blesses the people, and he's doing good for the people. He's a righteous king after the order of Melchizedek. The people will always be blessed under this kind of rulership where the wrong kind of rulership is take taxes and make yourself great and make your own name great. But in David's case, because of this, we're going to see in the next chapter, God tells David, I'm going to make your name great and I will make your descendants name great, referring to Yeshua, the one who will truly officiate after the order of Melchizedek. And this is where it really gets good because we're going to dissect every single word in prophecy that he gives to David's descendant and we're going to see it identified and fulfilled in Yeshua. So David returned to bless his household. And Michal, the daughter of Shaul, came out to meet him. And she said, such honor the king of Israel earned for himself today. <laughs> She's mocking him. Exposing himself before his servants. Slave girls like some vulgar exhibitionist. David answered Michal, in the presence of Adonai, who chose me over your father and over everyone in his family to make me chief over Adonai's people, over Israel, I will celebrate in the presence of yod heh vav -Heh. I will make myself even still more contemptible than that. Like, if you thought that was bad, I'm totally going to be devoid of self. I'll do all kinds of crazy things for the Lord. He's, that's what he's saying, in essence. He says, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes, but those slave girls you mentioned will honor me. Michal, the daughter of Shaul, then remained childless from that day forward. She brought a curse on herself. Remember the teaching that I did on Lashon Hara and how we bring a curse on ourselves when we align ourselves with Hasatan against one of our brothers. Well, she was childless, barren, which is a sign of a curse from that day forward. So now in chapter 7, Verse 1, after the king had been living in his palace a while, and Adonai had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Natan the prophet, here, I am living in a cedar wood palace. David's recognizing, I've built this amazing palace for myself, but the ark, it has no home. I want to build something better than even my own palace for the Lord. So his intentions are good, but is he adding to? God's going to correct him through the prophet Nathan. He says, here, I'm living in a cedarwood palace, but the ark of God is kept in a tent. Natan said to the king, go do everything that's in your heart, for Adonai is with you. It sounds good on the surface. Sometimes we're very quick to say, well, that will glorify God. Go ahead and do it. But is it in harmony with the word? We always have to make sure that we're in harmony with the word. Verse 4 says, And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says yod heh vav -Heh, Shalt thou build me a house to dwell in? A permanent dwelling, in essence? That's what a house is. It's not something like the tabernacle that could be taken down, and it, that it was temporary, that after the people were made holy enough that God could dwell in them, and there would be no need for another tabernacle. But a permanent house, that's kind of like saying you always want God to be close, but not totally in you. You want to just keep him at arm's length. He says, I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day. But I have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. In all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, spoke I a word with any of the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build ye not me a house of cedar? Basically, in all the times I've communicated with you, have I ever asked why you didn't build me a permanent house? God didn't desire that because the model was it was only temporary until we be made right as a holy temple. The whole house of Israel is in a process of sanctification, which means being made holy, being set apart from the world for his indwelling. 
Now therefore, so shalt thou say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep yard, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people. Here's the first beautiful example of the son of David in David's loins. David was a shepherd. He was actually taken from the sheep. He was living out in the sheep yard with the sheep. He took him from being a sheep to being a shepherd. Now Judah is likened to being a sheep, right? And Yeshua says, I have sheep in manifold, meaning not only Judah, the whole house of Israel, all the tribes. So the model is go from being a humble sheep and following in the example of the shepherd, then you too can be a shepherd. And then the shepherd ends up becoming ruler. So see, there's a little hidden model in this. And he says, I was with thee wherever so you went. And I have cut off all your enemies out of your sight. So here's another principle that he will do through the son of David that he's done for David. And I have made thee a great name. Third principle. We will dissect all of these in a little bit. Like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them. That place is to bring the lost house of Israel back to the land, that they might dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. So this is referencing the return of the exiles in the last days through David. And as since... This is why Ezekiel and the prophecies of the millennial temple refer to, and David my prince, so offer sacrifices. And it's always referring to the fulfillment of these prophecies in David, but it's Mashiach bin David. It's Messiah. He says, I'm going to appoint a place for my people, and I'm going to plant them there, that they might dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges, like Samuel was the last of the judges, to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord tells thee that he will make thee a house. So he's going to not only make Israel the tabernacle in which he's going to dwell, but before that can be fully completed at the end of the millennium, Yeshua is going to come and build the tabernacle. When thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed, this is the key word, the seed of David, after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, out of thy loins, and I will establish his kingdom. Now, people that don't want to recognize Yeshua, they'll say, oh, well, this is referring to Solomon, right? He built the permanent house. But you'll see that these prophecies could not be fulfilled in Solomon because, Yeshua, because the father said, and I will make his kingdom forever and ever. Solomon's kingdom was not forever. He died and his kingdom was divided. Yeshua is going to restore that kingdom, rebuild the temple and his kingdom will be forever and ever. So this can't, we can't just allow people to pass this off as already being fulfilled in Solomon. He says that this seed will build a house for my name. He's going to be the one to build the temple and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever and ever. And I will be his father. And what is this seed of David going to be called? The son of God. He's going to be recognized as the son of God. This is the first mention of this term, which throughout Yeshua's life, everyone recognized him as the son of David and the son of God. And you'll see this interchangeably. And I've put some quotes later that we can prove this because if I don't actually put the quotes and if I just mention or tell you what the quotes are I'm going to have people writing to me and saying what was that quote again and can you prove this and so we're going to actually read through each one of these quotes and in so doing it's going to write it and confirm it upon our own hearts so this seed of David is going to build the temple in the future and his kingdom will be established forever and he'll be known as the son of God. And it says if he commits iniquity, God will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. Now we know that Yeshua committed no iniquity, but he was born in the likeness of sinful flesh through the lineage of Adam. And we know that he chose, he willingly 
took our stripes for our iniquity, Isaiah 53 says, which is called the suffering servant. He didn't take stripes because of his own iniquity. He took stripes because of our iniquity. And it says, by his stripes, we are healed. In essence, what it's telling us is he took the cause and effect of our sin, which lead to death and eternal separation from the Father. He was willing to take that upon himself so that we could have a chance to be reconciled back to the Father and live eternally with the Father. This is what 1 John, or not 1 John, but John 3.16 is referring to when it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He was willing to perish for us. God says, But my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it away from Saul, the first king of Israel, whom I put away before thee. Basically, you saw how he was deposed because he didn't continue in my ways, is what God's telling David. And thine house and thy kingdom, David, shall be established forever before thee through this future seed. Thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak to King David. So now let's dissect these and see how they're fulfilled in Yeshua. Once again, we remember that Samuel was the first one during this long lineage of corrupt kings and priests who exemplified the Melchizedek priesthood. He officiated as prophet, priest, and ruler, even though he wasn't a son of Aaron. He was a Levite from Kohat. And he had the Melchizedek anointing. And God revealed to him that David was to be the true king of Israel. And so he, when he anointed him, he passed on this Melchizedek blessing, this Melchizedek anointing to David. And through David, and literally in David's physical DNA, is the lineage of Melchizedek through Tamar, his great, 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 great grandmother. <laughs> so through his loins, Yeshua has that same DNA from literal Melchizedek. So there's a spiritual lineage anointing, but there is a literal DNA also. And we're going to see that this is even prophesied about uh, in Psalms by King David. Where does King David say that King Mashiach, his future seed, will come from? By his own words, what we're going to do is have a little fun with some of David's Psalms, and before we parallel those prophecies that God gave David through Natan, we're going to see what David himself says about the future Messiah. Psalms 89, 19 says, Our king is from the Holy One of Israel. This means that he's not only the Son of God, but he will come from God. And we know that John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So truly, he did come from the Holy One of Israel. Where does he currently sit? We know in his first coming, Yeshua was the prophet like unto Moshe that Deuteronomy 18 prophesied. He told Moshe, who was the most humble and meek of all men, I will send a prophet like unto Moshe. He's going to be humble. He's going to be meek. This is how you'll identify him. If you're looking for a king in his first coming, you're going to miss him. And he's going to speak my words. And anyone who doesn't listen to my words will have to answer to me. This is what God said to Moses in Deuteronomy 18. And so we see him fulfilling this prophet uh, role. Yeshua was a prophet. He foretold the future. And he was also the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. He willingly took stripes for our iniquities so that we would not have to. So we see him prophet and suffering servant. But when do we start to see his priesthood, this Melchizedek priesthood coming into place? It's actually from the time that he ascended from the grave and ascended to the Father, he's been officiating as a priest in the heavenly sphere. Even before we see him officiating in the earthly sphere, he's officiating in the heavenly sphere. So this is why David prophetically says where he currently sits and reigns from. David's in Psalms 110 verse 1, and the whole chapter of 110 is very prophetic. I encourage you to read the whole thing, but I'll take a little excerpts from it. He says that he's at the right hand of God. Where will he reign from in the future? Psalms 110 verse 2, the next verse says, Adonai will send out your powerful scepter from Zion. 
And Psalms 45, verse 6 and 7 says, The scepter, referring to the scepter that comes out from Zion of thy kingdom, is a righteous scepter. This is further proof of the Melchizedek priesthood because a scepter denotes rulership and Zadik means righteousness. So Malki means king. That's the scepter aspect. King of righteousness. Zadik. And he was a priest and a king at the same time in both offices. David goes on to say, after he says, The scepter of thy kingdom is a righteous scepter, that thou loved righteousness, and you hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above all thy fellows. So this is a hidden reference to, he's going to get the Melchizedek anointing, like Solomon did and like David did, above, it says, all your fellows. Who's all his fellows? The house of Israel through whom the Levites were given temporary charge of the priesthood, but the Melchizedek priesthood is above that, and Yeshua is going to be given an anointing above all of his fellows. What will his reign look like? Psalms 110 verse 4. You are a priest forever, he prophesies of the coming Messiah, after the order of Melchizedek. So here it is. It's not just speculation. He's actually calling out Melchizedek. And David is of the lineage of Melchizedek through Tamar, and thus Yeshua is as well. And the prophet Zechariah confirms this in chapter 6, verse 11 through 13, when he says, Then take silver and gold, and make crowns, and set them upon the head of Yehoshua. This is the true name of what the world calls Jesus, and what we say sometimes, very we shorten it to Yeshua, but he in his day would have heard Yehoshua. It's what we call today Joshua. It means Yah's salvation. He was literally Yah's salvation in human flesh. He's talking about and even calling out the very name of Yeshua. Because there was an old high priest named Yehoshua in their day. And so he's using this as an analogy to point forward to the coming Messiah. And, he, and this Yehoshua is called the son of Yah Zadik. Yeho Zadik is Yah's righteousness, another reference to Malki Zadik. So Yah's salvation is going to come from Yah's righteousness, the high priest. And he says, speak to him, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, saying, behold a man whose name is Branch, or sometimes Shoot, it's Zema in Hebrew. And it means the root is called the root of Jesse in other passages. Right? He's referring to this prophecy about David and there's going to be a new shoot just like that comes up from an olive tree it shoots up from the root well Yeshua will shoot up from the root of Jesse and from the root of Melchizedek this is why he's called a shoot behold a man and he's going to be a man a shoot from the root of Jesse according to Isaiah 11:10 and who shall shoot up out of humility and build the temple of the Lord even he shall build the temple of the Lord. So here's a double confirmation that he's the one that's going to build the temple of the Lord. And he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne. So you see the kingship along with the priesthood. And he will be a priest upon his throne. So king and priest at the same time. And the council of peace shall be between both. Just like Melchizedek ruled over Salem, which means the city of peace, and Jerusalem, Yeshua, the Son of God, from the root of Jesse, shall shoot forth and be a high priest and king and build the temple of the Lord. We have a double witness of this. Now let's go back and look at the prophecies that God gave through Nathan to David and see how they're fulfilled in Yeshua. The first thing is that we saw that he would go from, be, from, go from the sheep to being a shepherd ruler. And we know David was a shepherd. The son of David, Yeshua of the Davidic line, in Psalms 23, remember, says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This is pointing forward to what Yeshua recognized in himself. Ezekiel 37, verse 24 says, My servant David will be a king over them. This is referring to the millennial age. And they will all have one shepherd. The whole house of Israel will be back together again. They will follow my laws and be careful to keep my decrees. 
they will live in a land I gave to their servant Jacob. So anyone that says that the Torah has been done away with, God's laws are not applicable for us today, that Yeshua has done away with them, why would he be teaching them and be careful to observe them in the millennial kingdom and returning the people to them if that was true? They will live in the land. So we're not in some heavenly place like some people teach for a thousand years. We're in the literal land of Israel that he gave to Jacob, the land where your fathers lived. They and their children and their children's children will live there forever. And David, this is a reference, prophetic reference to Messiah, my servant, will be their prince forever. John 10, 11 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. This is the ultimate example of God's character in his word being made flesh. I'm the good shepherd and I know my sheep. And I am known of mine. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. You know, John 1, 18 says that he has come and fully explained the Father. Through his life, he's totally revealed what the Father's character looks like. In selfless love to the point of he's willing to lay down his life for his brothers. And that's what he says. I lay down my life for the sheep. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring. And that's why he's allowed 2,000 years from the good news of the prophecies are being fulfilled in this person, Yeshua. And we see the first two prophecies being fulfilled in prophet and, and suffering servant. And he is now allowed 2,000 years for this message to go forth to wake up the lost house of Israel that have intermingled with all the nations of the world. And in so doing, God has been able to reach more of the world than he would have been able to if he had just kept Israel in one nation. So it's actually an act of mercy, like the previous prophecy said, through Yeshua, in that God has allowed Israel to be scattered to all the nations to reach everyone who would be grafted into Israel and be a part of that bride, to be a part of the sheep. How do we know what his sheep look like? They hear his voice. They recognize him in the scriptures. And they will be of one fold. Ezekiel 36 and 37 talk about the two sticks coming back together and being one fold, one stick. And he will be one shepherd. Therefore does my father love me, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. Beautiful example of a selfless sheep. You know, Isaiah 53 says, He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Another reference of a sheep. Yet he openeth not his mouth. Sheep that go right to the slaughter, and they don't even kick and buck and bleat and... They're just very peaceful. And he had that principle of peace all the way through. Once again, another aspect of going from sheep to shepherd. He was the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. He became the shepherd. Now, David is told in verse 9 of 2 Samuel, of our Hoff Torah, 2 Samuel 7, that God will cut off his enemies before him. So God's going to do this work. Let's see how God prophesies that he's going to cut off the enemies of Israel through Messiah. Luke 20, verse 41 says, He said to them, How say they that Messiah is David's son? And David himself said to him in the book of Psalms, yod vav said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand. This is what he's told Yeshua since his ascension. Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. This is in the process of being fulfilled. David therefore called him Lord. How is he then his son? So Yeshua is even bringing in this prophecy that David quoted from Psalms, referring to himself, to bring it home to himself, to help the people recognize that he's the son of David. And that God will make his enemies, because they couldn't understand, why are you not getting rid of your enemies, the Romans, right now, and setting free the Jewish people? And so he's helping them realize God has a perfect timing for everything. But first he has to sit at the right hand of God and wait until God makes his enemies his footstool. Then he will return. Zechariah 12, 8 through 10 says, In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And he that is feeble among them in that day shall be as David. And the house of David shall be as God. So who comes through the house of David? Yeshua. And as the angel of the Lord before them, he's coming back, it says, arrayed in, uh, for battle to protect his people. 
And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. And they'll look at me whom they have pierced. Now this is in Zechariah. This is 500 years before Yeshua ever came. And he's prophesying about his second coming when he comes back to do away with Israel's enemies and how then the Jewish people will say, oh, it was you all along. Oh, and what a blessing we've lost over these last 2,000 years and not recognizing you. And they'll mourn as one mourns for a firstborn son, it says. And he is the firstborn only son of God, as God prophesied. I will be a father to him and he shall be my son. And they will be in grief for him. This is a beautiful glimpse 2,500 years ago of the second coming and how the Jewish people will recognize him when he comes and how he's coming back to do away with the enemies of his people. Zechariah 14, verse 13 says, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. This is talking about at the sixth plague, the battle of Armageddon, when all the nations of the earth, very soon to come, will gather against Jerusalem. The Lord will come back and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, the very place that he ascended from. The men were looking up until he was received in the clouds out of sight. And the angels came and said, Ye men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up? Know ye not that this same Yeshua will come back in like manner? In essence, he's going to come back to the exact same place that he ascended from. And it's going to fulfill the prophecy in the second coming. So we see multiple places that refer to God disposing of his enemies. This future son of David. The next thing God said is he's going to make... David's seed, this future descendant, his name great. And we know that Yeshua is given a name above all names in the end. In Isaiah 42, we see prophecies that pertain to this, as well as Isaiah 11, verse 10. It says, In that day there shall be a root of Jesse. Once again, it's taking it back to David and these earlier prophecies, which shall stand for an ensign to the people. Uh, ensign is like a banner. It has the name of the tribe on it. So in essence, this name is on the banner. And to it shall the Gentiles seek. So God is using Yeshua through Israel to bring in all the Gentiles. And it says, His rest shall be glorious. It's going to be a thousand years of rest. It's starting the 7,000th year, which is a symbol that we see every week in the weekly Shabbat. The seventh day is a day of rest. The seventh millennium, because a day is like a thousand years to the Lord, is going to be a thousand years of rest. And His rest will be glorious. It will be a wonderful time where Torah is being written upon our heart and we are being restored to the image of God. Matthew 12, 16 quotes Isaiah 42 and another beautiful place where we see this name issue. And he charged them when they started to recognize Yeshua, you're the prophesied Messiah. And they expected him to fulfill all of these prophecies in one coming. He said, it's not time yet to make me known as the king or as high priest. So he charged them that they should not make him known, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. And then Matthew quotes the prophet Isaiah. Behold thy servant whom I uphold, my elect, in whom my soul's delights. I have put my spirit upon him. Isn't this beautiful? The father speaking of the son. I delight in him. This is why at his mikvah anointing, they heard the father's voice. Behold, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I have put my spirit upon him. And he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry or lift up his voice to be heard in the streets. Basically, he's not going to announce that he's Messiah in his first coming. That's what it's saying. He's not going to be full of self and make a big proclamation about himself. He was so meek and humble and quiet in the way he went amongst the people and healed them and ministered to them. He's going to be like a bruised reed, but he will not break. It's not going to be the end of him, in essence. And smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment to truth. 
he shall not fail. So even though you saw him crucified and he rose again, and people over the last 2,000 years said he's a failed Messiah. This is what the Jews call him. There's false messiahs, and then there's failed messiahs. There's, they believe that there can be a messiah in any generation, but because he didn't fulfill all of the word, he can't aptly be called messiah yet, right? He has to, Mashiach means anointed, and that anointing comes when you take your proper place as king. And so they're looking forward to the messiah, and so are we. But he did not fail just because there's 2,000 years between the first fulfillment of prophecies and then 2,000 years to gather the whole house of Israel amongst the nations, and he will return as Messiah and high priest. So this is why it says, He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he set judgment in the earth. This is in the millennial kingdom. And the isles, this is where Israel's been dispersed to, all the isles, all the islands out in the seas shall wait for his law, for his Torah. We're all looking forward to it. We're still in the isles, so to speak. This prophecy is expressly referred to the Messiah, even by the Targumists. This is what's beautiful. They looked at this prophecy of Isaiah 42 and they recognized it was speaking of Messiah. So the early rabbis did acknowledge this text referring to Messiah. And they even said, the Targumists added this, behold, they put Messiah in this word, Mashiach. So they, when they would read this, they would actually say, behold, my servant Mashiach, they, so that there would be no question as to its reference in the early days. Now, since then, there's a lot of people that don't want to recognize Yeshua, so they have taken out a lot of the earlier understanding of our earlier rabbis 2,000 years ago, and uh, you, you see them kind of doing away with scriptures that pertain to fulfillment in Yeshua. And then Matthew goes on and says, and in his name shall the Gentiles trust. So God is truly making his name great in that not only Israel is going to recognize their Messiah, but all of the world is going to recognize his name. And they're going to trust in his name. And that's what's happened through, largely in part, this Christian movement that has morphed from Judaism and dispersed amongst all of the nations, even though it hasn't been perfect and they've eroded at the Torah, it has taken the name of Yeshua to all of the nations and the Gentiles trust in that name. So it's beautiful and, and he will correct them when he comes back, but it's had its purpose. In Philippians, Rabbi Shaul Philippians 2 9 says, Wherefore God has also highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. Now, a name is indicative of a character, and he's exemplifying God's character the best of selfless love, right? So, he who is the very word of God in human flesh does not think it equality to be equal with God, and he lowers himself to the lowest position. And in that act of humility, his character should be glorified. And this is why God gives him a name above all names, because he's the ultimate revelation of selfless love in the human flesh. This is the living Torah in human form, where the Word couldn't show us the beauty of God's character to its total depth. Yeshua could in laying down his life. The next thing he told David in 2 Samuel 7.10 is that God will use him to plant his people back in Israel. So let's see what the prophets say about that. What's so interesting is even Maimonides understood this principle and he wrote in one of his books called The Law of Kings. He said, this is, I'm quoting from Maimonides now, the Messianic king will arise in the future and restore the Davidic kingdom to its former state and original sovereignty. This is what we call the Davidic kingdom, totally united, Israel and Judah. All the laws will be reinstituted in his days, as they had been aforetimes. Sacrifices will be offered. We see that in Zechariah 14. And the sabbatical years and jubilee years will be observed fully as ordained by the Torah. I look forward to that day, don't you? This is exciting. Anyone who does not believe in him or whoever does not look forward to his coming denies not only the other prophets, but also the Torah of Moses, because they're all speaking to Yeshua, all pointing to him. 
For the Torah attested to him, as it is said, then yod heh vav -Hey, your God, will bring back your exiles. Of all the quotes that Maimonides could have quoted, he quotes the return of the exiles as being the proof of the Mashiach. So this is why the Jews have a veil over their eyes right now. They don't recognize him because he has not returned all the exiles. He has not restored the eternal kingdom of God to Jerusalem. And he's not reigning as high priest and, and king. And he hasn't rebuilt the temple. And so it's no wonder with so much erosion to God's word, we want to protect God's word, and we don't want to just lightly call somebody Messiah who's not Messiah. Even though it looks like he failed, he will come back, and it will be the same one, and they will then recognize him, and this is going to be one of the key indicators that takes that veil away. When the exiles of Israel are returned back to the land, and he has mercy, here he's quoting Deuteronomy 30, he's quoting the Torah, yod -Heh -Vav -Heh, your God, will bring back your exiles, and he will have mercy upon you, and he will once again gather you from all the nations. This happens at the second coming. Remember when it says, the Lord shall descend with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Messiah will rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up with them. So this is how he's going to gather everyone up, his bride, his people, and then he will take them to Israel. Even if your exiles are to the ends of the heavens, the Lord your God will gather you from there, and he will take you from there. So don't worry. If you're the f most farthest person out in a little Pacific island, he's going to take you from there and bring you back if you are crafted into Israel, if you're a part of uh, his people, if you recognize him, if you believe in him. And the Lord your God will bring you. These words explicitly stated in the Torah include all the statements made by all the prophets, said Maimonides in Mishnah Torah, Law of the Kings, 11, verses 1 and 2. Jeremiah, chapter 31, the very place where we get the definition of the new covenant being God writing his Torah upon our hearts, says, Hear the word. So who are we supposed to listen to? The word made flesh, Yeshua. Hear the word of Yahweh, O nations, and declare in the coastlands afar off. And say to everyone, he who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. So now you see two prophecies brought together. It's the good shepherd who's going to gather the flock together. And this is going to be the key indicator that he's the true Messiah. So then... The prophet Natan told David that God will establish one of your seeds as this person that will be the shepherd ruler and do away with the enemies and his name will be great and return the exiles. And so we'll see how this is fulfilled. Matthew 20, 30 says, And behold, two blind men, they couldn't even see physically, but they could spiritually see. They had spiritual eyes to recognize this was the fulfillment of the prophecies concerning the son of David. They were sitting by the way, and when they had heard that Yeshua passed by, they cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. They knew the prophecies. They had had them read to them from their young days, and even without physical eyesight, and sometimes that's what it takes for us to have more spiritual eyesight than physical eyesight, to believe by faith that this same one who came 2,000 years ago will come again and fulfill the rest of the prophecies, and that he is the son of David and of the order of Mel Melchizedek, it brings it all in together. Matthew 21, 9 said, and the multitudes even. So when people say, oh, the Jews rejected Jesus. No, they didn't. The multitudes loved him. There was a few key leaders who were seeking to hold on to power who rejected him for certain purposes. But the people recognized the fulfillment of prophecy in him. And they went before him and they cried out welcoming him on the 10th day of Aviv, which is when the lamb comes into the household to be inspected for four days before Passover. Four days before he was sacrificed as the lamb of God, he came into Jerusalem and the people recognized him as the lamb of God and as the son of David. And they shouted, laying down their coats and the palm branches. And they said, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. See, he has Yah's name in his name. Yah's salvation is Yehoshua. So literally his name, even, he comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So the blind men recognized him. The population recognized him. The only people who it was an inconvenient truth to were the leaders who weren't ready to let go of their power and their self and their ego. 
Now, some people will say, we have a problem with the genealogy in Matthew 1 because it refers to this genealogy of Joseph, and he wasn't the literal son of Joseph. Why is the genealogy taken from Adam down through Joseph in Matthew 1? Anybody know? Huh? Well, but, but what they're saying, their argument is that Yeshua is not the physical seed of Joseph. Therefore, we cannot say he's the physical son of David. Therefore, we cannot say that he can fulfill the Messianic prophecies. The only reason for the genealogy in Matthew 1 is to prove that Mary was a righteous woman in keeping the commandments totally in that she would marry somebody from her own tribe. So it's establishing that she's currently betrothed to Joseph. She's not married yet, but she gets pregnant by the word of God as seed in her womb. And if she was not a fit virgin, then there would be a problem. But it's showing even her righteousness and that she's betrothed to someone from Judah because she's from Judah. Then in Luke 3, we see a lineage of Mary. And what's interesting is the lineage of Joseph goes through Solomon, King David through Solomon, and goes through Jehoiakim and some of these unrighteous kings who God says, because of your unrighteousness, no king will ever arise in Israel from your lineage. So no king could rise from Joseph's literal lineage. But Mary's lineage comes from King David still and from Melchizedek still, but it goes through Natan, his son Nathan, instead of Solomon, and thereby bypasses those wicked kings and comes down as a pure lineage of the order of Melchizedek and son of David. And so the true lineage of Yeshua is in Luke 3. Many people get confused as to why is that lineage there in Matthew 1 if he's not from Joseph. And it's just to show that Mary was righteous in marrying somebody from her tribe. It confirms that Joseph was from Judah like she was from Judah, from the house of David in essence. So I just want to bring that out because that's a, a, a common question I see coming up with people. Then God promised David that his seed would build the temple in 2 Samuel 7.13. So we're going to see that God uses his seed to build the temple in Psalms 110, verse 4, and Zechariah 6. He says, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, a priest who reigns as a righteous king. And as we read before in Zechariah 6.11 and 12, it says, He will shoot out from his hum humble place. So his first coming was in humility. His second coming, even though he shoots out from this place, this is where he's born and grows, he will be the one to build the temple. And so we have a confirmation here that he will build the temple. He's not only going to reign in the temple, but he's going to be the one to restore the true temple and restore the Torah teachings through that. Then we see he will be called Son of God. And in Luke 1.35, we see the angel answered and said to Mary, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. This in Hebrew is the Ruach HaKodesh. And the power of the highest shall overshadow you. So what happens when a man has relations with a woman? He overshadows her. This is intimate language. And the word of God is going to be planted in her as seed. This is why the parable of the sower and the seed gets interpreted as, and the seed that he sowed was the word of God. And the soil is the fertile soil of men's hearts, some more rocky than others. Sometimes it doesn't receive the, the word of God. And so the word of God is literally likened to DNA seed that impregnates this virgin that was prophesied about in Isaiah. And he says that this holy thing that shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So we have a confirmation from the angel. And when the tempter, even Hasatan, came to tempt him after 40 days of fasting, he's at his weak point, he says, you know, Yeshua is recognizing that he's the Son of God and he's the fulfillment of these prophecies. And Satan is saying, if you really want to prove that you're the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. And notice every temptation, there was three of them, he always starts off with saying, if you're truly the son of God, because Hasatan knew, and he's trying to thwart God's plan through his son by getting him to, to sin. 
And then even the other unclean spirits. I like to show not only the angels recognize him, but Hasatan, and then the other demonic spirits of that day. Mark 3.11 says, And unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him, and they cried out, saying, Thou Son of God! You are the Son of God, they said. And later, when there was a, a demoniac, remember the demoniac spoke, and the demon spoke through him in Matthew 8.29. And behold, they, this legion of demons cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Yeshua, you son of God, thou son of God? Art thou come to hinder, to torment us before the time? They understood from the prophet Enoch that there would be a time for their judgment at the end of days. But the 7,000 year cycle had not been completed. They're saying, hey, you came early. Is it, are you going to come here to torment us before it's time for our judgment? They couldn't stand it. They recognized the timing of even their own judgment. And this is what many people do not recognize because, unfortunately, the book of Enoch has been thrown out from the scriptures, but it unfolds the origin of sin and uh, the contamination of the mixture of these fallen angels with man and how they were placed in judgment. In some places it calls a, a prison, basically awaiting the coming judgment after the thousand years. Even Satan, remember, is bound for a thousand years so that he deceives the nations no longer. And then they will be released for a time and they will be judged in the great white throne judgment at the end of the thousand years. So they're recognizing that it's not their time and they're recognizing him as the son of God. John 20, verse 30 and 31 says, And many other signs truly did Yeshua in the presence of his disciples do, which are not even written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Yeshua is the Anointed One, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life through his name. Now all of a sudden all these texts have so much more meaning when we understand they were all relating to the original prophecies that he had to come in as the Son of God, the Son of David, the Anointed One, his name, and that we must believe in that. All these things were written about. And the very last thing that God revealed to David that his seed would establish is the kingdom. God's kingdom would be established on earth, and it would be an eternal kingdom, and he would reign forever and ever, unlike all other kings before him. And we see this fulfilled even in Daniel 2, 44, we see Nebuchadnezzar's vision of the history of the earth. And remember there was the head of gold, Babylon, and the breast of silver, which was Persia, and the loins of bronze, which were represented Greece as, as a world power. The two legs of Rome representing eastern and western and eastern Rome, the iron legs, and then the feet of iron and clay. It says, in the days of those kings, you will see a stone cut without human hands coming from the heavens, and you will smite the image and he will do away with all previous kings and kingdoms and this stone will become a mighty mountain in the earth and his kingdom will not end it will last forever in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it will stand forever and then later in another vision, Daniel 7, 27 says, And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. So who are the saints? The Greek word in Revelation, when it talks about the saints, it uses the word hagios. Hag comes from a Hebrew root, which means feasts. So they're feast keepers. They're people who've returned to God's word. Yeshua says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So saints are literally defined, what John saw in vision, as those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Yeshua. Both. This is a good definition of the saints in Revelation 12, 17 and Revelation 14, 12. Two places, another double witness. 2 Peter 1.10 says, Wherefore, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, because you've been called to represent him as a kingdom of priests. What he's doing through his reign as Melchizedek, as the order of Melchizedek, he is renewing the covenant with Israel that was lost to the Levitical priesthood. 
So when people talk about a new covenant, it's nothing new. He's just renewing what God had originally intended. This high election for you is to be a kingdom of priests, to be a royal priesthood, a peculiar people, a bride that God can dwell in. And this is what's being renewed through the son of David, Yehoshua, through the order of Melchizedek, to return us back to God's original intent when he said to Israel, before all the sacrifices were given to Israel to atone for their sins, he was telling them verbally his Torah. And it was being written upon their heart, but they said, we don't want to hear it. It's too much for us. Speak to Moses and have him tell us what you're to say. God's original intent was to have a royal priesthood that he could speak to, and his words would permeate their heart. And that in so doing, they would become living Torahs themselves. This is what Jeremiah 31 is returning us to. He says, this is not the covenant I made with your forefathers, basically speaking to having to have a sacrificial system through the Levites. He says, I'm going to renew my covenant and write my Torah upon your heart. This is what people call the new covenant. And yet they use, they say, I'm not under the law. I'm under the new covenant. The new covenant is having the law of God's love, his Torah, written upon our hearts so that we live it out naturally and we don't even need to refer to a book. And so it's beautiful how Yeshua, this high priest and king, will come back and as a living Torah, write this upon our hearts. And this is the election that Peter is speaking of when he says, let's be diligent. We have such a high calling. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua, the Anointed One. So we see in his first coming, him fulfilling all the prophecies pertaining to a prophet like unto Moshe in Deuteronomy 18, the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. He's a shepherd over Israel. And he's reigning currently at the right hand of God as a high priest interceding with us. It says, we have not yet a high priest that's not touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He came in the likeness of human flesh, so he even knows how to intercede for us and how to pray. This is why the Spirit can pray with groanings deeper than words for us. And when he returns, we will recognize him as Mashiach because he will rebuild the temple and return the exiles of Israel. And all of Israel, it says, remember Paul in Romans says, and all Israel will be saved. Judah will recognize him. They will receive him. So when people feel like, oh, we've got to go and convert the Jews, this is really erroneous thinking because God's going to be the one to convert their heart. They're living out Torah in not saying that somebody's Messiah who, unless we by faith can recognize it, we see it with spiritual eyes, but they're like, the, have a veil still over their eyes. And they're, in so doing, preserving the word of God. So they have a purpose too. 1 Peter 2 9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his beautiful light. This is such an awesome promise. And now you can see what all the word was pointing to in Yeshua being the promised one of God through David. So with that, let's stand and say the blessing over the Hoff Torah. Praise to you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, rock of all creation, righteous one of all generations, the faithful God whose word is deed and whose every command is just and true. For the Torah, for the privilege of worship, for the prophets, and for this Shabbat that you, Adonai, our God, have given us for holiness and rest, for honor and glory, we thank you and bless you. May your name be blessed forever by every living being. Praise to you, Adonai, for the Sabbath and for its holiness. Abba Father, we thank you for revealing to us with spiritual insight the depth of your word being made flesh and being fulfilled in our hearing. We see that every prophecy points to Yehoshua as the son of David after the order of Melchizedek and how he is reigning as high priest and he will return to reign as high priest and king. And so we look forward to this and by faith, Father, having this belief and this high calling, this election, may we live out your Torah. May we begin to have it written upon our hearts and may we walk in the paths of your righteousness for your namesake, O oh God, so that we will be a bride with without spot or blemish when Messiah comes to receive his bride. We thank you, Father, for revealing these things to us that we might partake of the blessings of the knowledge of him who you sent for us. 
Thank you. We love you. And we ask your blessing on the remainder of our Shabbat today. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.